In 1986, James McGill Buchanan was awarded the Alfred Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. He was recognized for his work in developing a theoretical framework that extends the tools of economic analysis into examining how political decisions are made. This work has come to be known as the public choice school of economic theory. Public choice theory, as pioneered by James Buchanan, provides a deeper understanding of how government policy is affected by the self-interest of politicians and other political and economic forces. In a way, his interest in both economics and political science are quite fitting. The son of Scotch-Irish parents, James Buchanan grew up on a large farm in a rural and agricultural area of Tennessee, very near the site of a pivotal conflict in the American Civil War, the Battle of Stones River. Although poor, his family had considerable status in their small community largely because his grandfather had served as governor of the state of Tennessee. The family expected that young James would follow his grandfather's example. I was groomed to be a lawyer. In a sense, I was groomed first to be a politician, to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. But the Depression altered those plans, as Vanderbilt University became too expensive for a family of limited means. Instead, Buchanan attended Middle Tennessee State Teachers College, largely because it was nearby and allowed him to live at home, where he could earn money for fees and books by milking dairy cows. Buchanan wasted no time in distinguishing himself as one of the finest students at the college, and after receiving his bachelor's degree in 1940, he was given a scholarship to the University of Tennessee for a year of graduate study in economics. He received a Master of Sciences degree in 1941. Plans to continue his graduate training at Columbia University were cut short by the prospects of the military draft. In August of 1941, Buchanan volunteered for service in the U.S. Navy and served four years at Pacific Fleet headquarters in Pearl Harbor and Guam. In 1945, he faced what he later called his only real career choice, whether to stay in the military, as he was urged by his superiors, or leave it for further academic training. Intrigued by the exciting intellectual climate he had heard about at the University of Chicago, Buchanan left what had been a very satisfying service in the military and embarked for his PhD studies in economics in the Midwest. While at the University of Chicago, he met Frank Knight, the famed economist, who was to be his greatest teacher and mentor. In Knight's price theory class, Buchanan was converted from his early belief in populist and socialist ideas. He became, as he later called it, a zealous advocate of the market order. Since then, James Buchanan has devoted his life to studying the fundamental structures of political and economic decision-making. Through such works as his classic, The Calculus of Consent, written in collaboration with Gordon Tullock, To the Limits of Liberty, published in 1975, To the Power to Tax, and The Reason of Rules, both written with Jeffrey Brennan, Buchanan has continued his push for new ways to approach these abiding questions. Liberty Fund invited Professor Buchanan to a conversation about his life and work with Jeffrey Brennan, his longtime associate, co-author, and close friend. Jeff Brennan is professor of economics at the Australian National University. In this program, which is part one of the conversation, they discuss the theory of public choice, Buchanan's exchange theory of economics, and constitutional thought. In part two, the conversation turns to such topics as the work ethic, the logic of free markets, subjectivism, anarchy, federalism, the Nobel Prize in economics, and Buchanan's personal experiences and philosophy. We welcome you to a conversation with Professor James Buchanan. Jim, uh, in 1986, shortly after you'd won the Nobel Prize, Alastair Cook on Letter from America yeah. 
described public choice as uh, the homely but important truth that politicians are, after all, just the same as the rest of us. Yeah. Um, what do you think of that as a description? Uh, many people interpret public choice uh, in, in that way, and that's certainly a central part of it. But um, uh, in a way, I always think that that's only part. Right. Uh, politicians and, and public choosers in all respects are, are just us, like the rest of us, and therefore motivated in the same way that we are. But uh, with that standing alone, I don't think you have public choice. I came at it with a, with a view of uh, criticizing basically welfare economics right. or, or uh, public finance economic public economics and this assumption of the of the state or being benevolent uh, government being benevolent which uh, was was naturally foreign to my to my thinking so in one sense that uh, uh, kind of a negative view or critical view of the uh, sort of idealized version of politics in the state uh, is very central to my own to my own contribution. Right. Yeah. Now you say that that was yeah. uh, alien to your thinking at the time, the fifties yeah, yeah, and sixties. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what was? Where did that thinking come from? Well, it's very difficult to know what the origins are. I, I um, um, I've described myself in my autobiography. I describe myself as a. Uh, before I went to the University of Chicago, I was a libertarian socialist, uh, which sounds like a contradiction in <laughs> terms, like but um, actually there was a, a political party in Weimar, Germany that was called libertarian socialist. Uh, but I was libertarian in the sense that uh, I was always uh, anti-government, anti-some uh, people controlling other people. But I was socialist in the sense that um, I didn't understand how markets worked and I thought the Wall Street barons were running the world right. and therefore maybe uh, something like social democracy would be better than what we had. And uh, I just didn't understand how markets can coordinate things. And right. uh, so in, in a sense, the libertarian part of that uh, libertarian socialist, which I was before I really learned economics, um, stemmed, and I think this is important, and it, do, it did stem from my uh, basic cultural heritage right. uh, as a Southerner, uh, right. as uh, you know, several, three generations away from a, a war in which we were defeated. Uh, I don't think I could have ever been under any conditions a sort of a strong nationalist, uh, pro-government uh, socialist yeah. in that sense. Mm -hmm. So I think that does explain a good deal of, mm -hmm. of why I came at it from the way I did. Let's talk about the public choice bit that's left over, yeah. as it were. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what uh, what do you think the the bits that aren't, as it yeah. were, reactive to yeah. political idealism involve? I mean, the pure science, as it were, of of politics. Well, you see. Uh, you go back to this first, your very first point about um, public choice is simply modeling politicians and bureaucrats and uh, like the rest of us. Right. That is, there are no particular saints, any more saints in politics, uh, probably less than there, right. there are elsewhere. But uh, that's not enough. Uh, that if you, if you start thinking about politics that way, then you sort of uh, very, you have a very empty uh, type of theory. So you have to come. And, and, and try to um, uh, explain uh, political structure, political order, uh, from some part of perspective that that will give you something other than simply an empty yeah. uh, theory or empty box. And uh, there, I've always thought that the the thing that must be added to that uh, must be this notion that at some ultimate level, uh, people must. Um, enter into political arrangements for mutual gain. There must right. be a shared benefit from, from uh, being involved in organized government. So in a, in a simple way of putting it, uh, I've always thought of what has to be added to that first uh, sort of politics without romance sort of thing. Right. That's, that's the first part. The right. second part is, is politics is some, in some ultimate sense an exchange process. Right. That is, you have to enter into a shared enterprise. Uh, with with other people, and uh, I think without that, uh, 
you, you, you have no uh, means of, um, uh, of justifying any political coercion of one person by another person. And you and I were just chatting earlier um, about why did Joseph Schumpeter have such small influence in, well, in, in uh, public choice. choice. You can go back and read in Schumpeter's Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, a book that was published as early as 1942. Uh, you can see almost all the precursory elements of this first point about politics. I mean, he, he modeled politicians and bureaucrats very much like what public choice does. But he had very little influence. Why? The answer was he had no hope. There was no hope there. There was no... It was a council of despair. If you looked at government that way and that's all you saw, uh, uh, you don't have any answers. I mean, uh, and of course Schumpeter was an elitist. He wanted uh, people like him to run the world. But um, that's the reason I think he didn't have any influence. You need to add to that. You need to add to that sort of be very skeptical about the motivations, about the behavior of politicians and bureaucrats, but also recognize that in fact there can be um, gains to all of us by sharing in a political enterprise and we can lay on or we can construct, we can uh, work out schemes whereby everybody benefits. Everybody puts in and everybody benefits. What I would call a kind of a Madisonian right. vision needs to be added to make public choice complete. Right. I think. So you, you, you're, it sounds as if you're actually quite sympathetic to those critics of public choice or at least yeah. a piece of the public choice yeah, apparatus yeah, yeah. that sees public choice as eroding social trust and uh, I mean you know the Mark Kilman yeah, argument yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. about this. There is an anxiety around that public choice really destroys the faith in democratic processes and by doing so uh, undermines something that's necessary to, to maintain it. I can understand it uh, on the other hand, uh, without accepting it. I can understand where that criticism is coming from. Right. Uh, and, and in a sense, it destroys a faith, but that faith is based on an illusion. Right. The illusion, somehow, that governments are benevolent, the illusion that politicians are saints. Now, I'm, I think I have ultimately enough faith in the wisdom of the ordinary people to think that we don't necessarily have to have such illusions. We don't necessarily uh, need to be uh, under those illusions in order to recognize politics for what it is. Okay, so let's come to this issue about exchange mm -hmm. uh, because that is an important part of your whole, mm -hmm. whole scheme. Um, not only in relation to politics, but also in relation to economics. I mean, yeah, you've argued yeah, yeah, in yeah. What Should Economists Do, yeah, for example, yeah. that uh, we ought to background the whole maximizing enterprise and foreground yeah, yeah, the exchange yeah, yeah. dimension. That goes back to this libertarian strand. That goes really? back to this notion somehow that there is no justification for anybody coercing anybody else. And uh, if you're not going to coerce people, how do you get people to do something? You exchange with them. You give the reciprocal relationship of one person with another person. And you build that up and you, are, uh, you start getting that more complex and more complex. And you ultimately end up in which we're all participating in a big exchange and which we're sharing uh, a commonality of, of, um, uh, of a government, of politics, and so forth and so on. So it, I don't think that that necessarily stems from anything other than the sense that how are you going to justify any coercion if you say no there's no coercion justified on any ground and you see unless you can bring in some transcendental purpose how can you justify coercion unless God is there are God's rules or right reason or something if you say no values start with us they start with individuals then how can one individual legitimately coerce another and trained as an economist starting thinking about exchanges, then it's easy to move into this sort of exchange version of politics, the theory of voluntary exchange, so forth, as, wow. as, as, as politics. Now, economists, I think, um, went down the wrong path when they got attracted by the calculus and started talking about maximizing, settling things at the margin, because that lends you directly into a, an alternative view of, of a way to look at the world.
I mean, I wondered whether one important aspect of the exchange versus maximising notion was that exchange is relational. You, yeah, know, you need two people to exchange. Yeah, exactly. or, and so there's, yeah. there's a centrally sort of social element yeah. in yeah. the account yeah. Of, yeah. Of, yeah. of exchange. Whereas in maximising, well, you know, Crusoe no, can uh, maximise exactly. on his island. Exactly. So, but then I wondered whether um, perhaps methodological individualism in a way connects mm. to this thinking about exchange. That is the idea that the problem with yeah. The maximising yeah, yeah, paradigm yeah. is that it too easily becomes we maximise, you know, so or society maximises yeah. or the economy yeah, maximises. Yeah. I think it's all tied up together. I right. don't think there's any way to separate it out. Uh, right. You go back and the, the fundamental unit of consciousness here is the individual and everything starts from the individual. That gives you the methodological individualism aspect. Right. And, and uh, no individual can legitimately coerce another, so then you, they, uh, necessarily you have relational uh, uh, dealings here, you have relational right. rela uh, relationships. I started to say, and uh, so it all—it's all part and parcel of the same thing. Uh, and once you slip into the maximizing notion, Crusoe maximizes uh, on his island, and then you have somebody—you had somebody you had Friday, and so forth. Then you. It's easy to slip to talk about them maximizing some joint uh, value or something like that, which which need not exist. Quite so. So does this, uh, I mean, this emphasis on methodological individualism and the nature of individual interaction explain, in part, your enthusiasm for for game theory? Game theory is is probably the most important contribution. Uh, in economics in the last century. Uh, matter of fact, I've um, written a little piece on that, right. making, making that argument. Uh, um, uh, and it's for that particular, exactly for that reason, because game theory, you see, in a game, in an ordinary game, uh, uh, you, you, neither player is choosing the outcome. Right. Uh, the outcome emerges from a, a choices made by different players, giving the alternatives that each faces. They each make a choice, the, an outcome emerges. The outcome is, is, is emergent in the sense that it's not chosen by anybody. So nobody is maximizing in a game. Nobody is maximizing whatever comes out. Uh, or, and, and you can model economics that way. If you and I are trading apples and oranges, uh, we end up stopping trade and you have so many apples I have so many oranges but that's not maxima that's not a maximum of anything it's no. just that I'm maximizing what is my utility by trading so many apples to you and vice versa with the oranges uh, to you but out of that emerges an outcome and it seems to me that that's the proper mindset for this sort of relationship that that people have with each other uh, in, in, the, in the trade relationship and all other relationships, you have outcomes that emerge. Outcomes aren't chosen by particular people. And that is where game theory, it seems to me, gives you the proper formal mindset uh, for, for, for understanding an exchange uh, relational process. Uh, whereas if you, if you take this other view, this maximizing view, you don't, you don't have that. No. Uh, yeah. Let me uh, ask you a question about some earlier work that you'd done on the, on the public debt. Um, this, let me see if this, is, if this is right about that work, that um, the real problem with the conception of the whole debt issue was mm -hmm. a false level of aggregation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that to take the remark that people often passed about internal mm -hmm. debt, for example, mm -hmm. That internal mm -hmm. debt mm -hmm. was debt we owed yeah, to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, an obvious question coming from an individualist point of view, yeah, I guess, is yeah. well, what's this we yeah, business? Yeah, right. Well, this gives me the opportunity to say something here, generally speaking. Um, I've been around a long time, and uh, I don't think modern economists or others. Uh, can possibly appreciate the level of thinking that went on uh, in the 1940s uh, 
not only about this, but about many other things. Um, uh, the naivete that was present in the thinking of so-called sophisticated economists there, you could, you just, it's unbelievable today. Right. It's just unbelievable. And uh, so uh, to think of the, uh, of the academic intellectual uh, uh, attitudes that uh, were purveyed about public debt mm. in the 1940s, in the post-Keynesian period, mm. um, it's very difficult for us to get in a mindset where well, that's obviously stupid. Right. It's obviously stupid. Right. And yet that's the way people taught it. That's the way it was in the textbooks. That's the way people believed. Uh, you see, the idea was, the, you go back to what you said about aggregation, uh, the, the idea was somehow that if you simply uh, look at nothing but resources and don't tie those resources to people, uh, that actually uh, you're using up the resources uh, at all at the same time. So therefore, how could you have a gross burden in the future? Uh -huh. But that's failure to relay anything back to individual choices. And, uh -huh. And all I did was to spell out that in in fair detail. Sure. It turned out that had that had been the strain in the in the in the literature. Uh, there were people uh, who had had that right, uh, but then you'd had a strand in the, uh, amongst economists all along who who'd slipped into this aggregation fallacy, mm -hmm. and then this aggregation fallacy became dominant in the uh, post-Keynesian world because the Keynesian uh, uh, implication for policy was you need to create deficits. Again, it was stupid. You didn't need wow. debt. You could do it with money, sure. even under the Keynesian scheme. Sure. But if you forget about that, the idea was you needed to have debts. We were in a permanent re uh, recession. We had too much saving. So we need to have government runs deficits. So therefore, you need debt. Therefore, you couldn't argue that the debt was a burden, so you wanted to argue it was no burden. So sure. it sort of, sort of, uh, the the normative purpose of the Keynesianism fit in with this fallacy of right. aggregation, and so you right. got this dominant view that was really dominant when I studied this stuff. Uh, that um, um, uh, there was no burden to debt whatsoever, so right. so on. You've said on a couple of occasions to me in relation to principles courses yeah, yeah, and textbooks yeah, yeah, and so on. Yeah. The real measure of the yeah. success of the book is how quickly it gets to exchange, and if yeah, you have yeah, a, you know yeah. a, an awfully long time of maximising and the yeah, theory yeah, of the firm yeah, and so on yeah. before you get to exchange, that's not a good idea. And uh, you know, I having read now your yeah, uh, yeah. what should economists do, yeah. um, you know, it's that's that fits. Uh, yeah. To me, von Bawerk, a famous Austrian right. economist, had the idea that that you start out economics by talking about two horse traders, right, uh, trading horses right. with each other. And that's the way you start, and I think that's the way to start. Or right. to use a geometrical term, you start with an Edgeworth box. Right. That is where you have two two commodities, two people right. trade, and, and, right. and you get. And I think that's a better way to start, and that fits in with the earlier comment about the game theory, because yes. here you you have these people coming together, interacting, and out of that something comes out. Sure. And I think that's a really a better way to start. And as far as I know, no textbook really has yet developed that fully. Quiet. Yeah. Yeah. The market looks like an instantiation of exchange, and you, one can mm. understand uh, somebody who is an exchange-oriented person mm. or a contractarian, mm. you know, as one, one might call it, being uh, a fan of the market, the application to politics in a way is, seems on, the, on its face a bit more strained, mm -hmm. don't you think? I mean, uh, politics looks like uh, intrinsically a coercive enterprise. It looks uh, as if there have got to be winners and losers. One team wins and the other team loses. Majorities exploit minorities and so on. Uh, doesn't it need an extra dimension of imagination and, uh, and perhaps uh, explication to see politics as exchange? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And, and also, uh, there's another aspect that ought to be mentioned here. Um, I, I said that 
conceiving politics as exchange is, in an ultimate sense, is part of public choice. Right. Uh, and that's properly true. But also politics is many other things. Right. And um, a lot of these approaches um, are simply alternative and, and complementary ways of looking at the same phenomena. Yeah. Some part of politics is pure conflict. That is, I'm trying to get it, take it away from you, and you're trying to take it away from me through poli to organize politics. So, sure. other part is simply some people enjoying the power of coercing others. Right. Certainly, those models explain much of of politics that we yeah. see. And this is I did learn this from Frank Knight. Go back to Frank Knight again. I think he and he was in turn influenced by Max Weber, right. strongly influenced by Max Weber, and and that is. You, you you work out alternative models of of analyzing phenomena and each of these models can give you insights you you uh, and Weber talked about ideal types right that is you can take a model that would look at politics as exchange you explain some part of politics public choice explains some part of politics maybe an important part it's not to be all and end all explanation by a long shot. Right. The pure conflict model uh, explains a part of politics, but again, it's not to be all end all. The coercive model explains. There might the, even the, even the uh, ideal theory uh, benevolence model right. explains a part of politics. So you look at, you use every model you can possibly have and you, you apply it to the phenomena that's out there. And the same right. thing is true of Marcus, the same thing is true of any institution. Uh, and to be sure, and, and that I think is important to recognize because a lot of people who criticize public choice or who are in favor of public yep. choice somehow slip into the assumption that you're trying to explain everything. You're not yes. trying to explain everything, you're trying to explain some elements of, of what you observe. And right. that's where you make terrible mistakes when you jump too quickly into this empirical nonsense. Right. Let's talk about the empirical yeah, nonsense. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. I mean, one of the features of a lot of economics yeah, yeah. these days is its econometric orientation. Uh, you don't approve of that. You you, you often been very critical of that mm -hmm. in print and elsewhere. Is it because you're testing, as it were, propositions lodged within a particular yeah. paradigm? Is exactly, that exactly. And you're assuming that somehow that paradigm is dominant over everything else. Right. And uh, uh, that need not be the case. Now, in many cases where it becomes obvious that it is, a, it is the dominant paradigm, you can, you can use the empirics if you want to. And again, you, to use a Frank Knight term, you're proving water runs downhill again. Right. It's obvious that certain things will happen if you do certain things, so you test it out, and so that's fine. But to, but to push it out the edges and then sort of try to do this empirical testing and, and look at real world data when you have a very mixture of things, of models that go into explaining, and then to sort of say, well, no, you didn't explain it, that you, you shouldn't have tried to explain it all. Right. This is where I think, and, and this is a, a, a rather critical difference here, this is where I think I'm a fan of experimental economics and I'm negative on econometrics right. or empirical right. economics. because. With experimental economics, they put people in situations, they look at the, uh, and if they're imaginative, they're interesting situations, and they see what comes out of it, mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily lock themselves implicitly or explicitly into a particular paradigm. You mentioned earlier your prodigious reading, um, mm. and I wanted to pick up one aspect of that, mm. also from the University of Chicago days, which is the story about how you, as it were, met Fixell. So do you want to, would you mind yeah, telling us that yeah. story? Uh, that I'll well, that's a f familiar story, anybody who has listened to me much, because um, the, the, the dominant influences on my, my career, my, my thinking, uh, have been two, uh, Frank Knight and Newt Vixell. Frank Knight uh, uh, was my teacher and my role model and everything else, and uh, uh, Vixell uh, got through, through reading Vixell. Newt Vixell, of course, was a um, well-known Swedish economist uh, who uh, was born, I believe, about 1851, died in 1926, covering that roughly, the turn right. of century period. And uh, as, as uh, students in, uh, at Chicago, as graduate students, we, were, we knew about Vixell, 
but we didn't know anything about him having written in public finance at all or public economics. As it turns out, however, Vixel um, had written his dissertation uh, after actually ac ac written it after some of the other books right. uh, in, and in 1896. Right. Uh, called Finance Theoretische Untersuchungen, which would be called Investigations in Public Finance. And um, one part of that book, one third of that book, uh, was on the pure theory of taxation. And uh, uh, I um, just happened by chance on that book. I had finished my uh, German reading exam, which at that time was required of all PhD students. You had to learn to read German. Um, and I had finished my thesis, my dissertation, so I had a couple of months before I was going to a first job. And I was just spending the time in the old Harper Library at the University of Chicago. And happened to pull down this very slight Vixel volume off the, off the shelves. And um, I may have even seen it before, for all I know, right. but I hadn't had made any impression. Right took it over to my desk and started reading it and literally it was as if the scales fell off my eyes because right. uh, here was a man saying what I sort of had implicitly felt uh, right. should be said uh, but um, would never have dared articulate and right. what he did was essentially develop this notion of somehow uh, the exchange process uh, through taxation. He was trying to extend the neoclassical uh, notion of efficiency uh, to the public sector. Right. Now, some others had tried that in Europe. Uh, continental writers were way ahead of the English language writers in, at this in the, at the, at the, at this level, and he was simply trying to extend this notion of allocative uh, efficiency to the public sector. Right. Under what kind of conditions then would you um, would you be sure that um, taxing and spending was giving you an efficient allocation of resources. And he saw that it was necessary to go back and look at the how decisions get made. So then he uh, started looking at the rules. You have a legislature, you have legislators, each of whom represents a particular interest. And if you're going to get a guarantee that uh, uh, a project was efficient, you would have to have those legislators, each of whom represented some interest, you'd have to have them agree unanimously right. because only then would you be sure that uh, everybody was getting some gravy, everybody right. was getting a benefit. Right. And so he developed the unanimity rule, right. the idea of somehow you need, that was the only real guarantee that you'd have an efficient project. Right. And you, if you allowed uh, variability, uh, there'd always be, if anything was efficient, there'd always be one scheme in which you could generate enough taxes uh, voluntarily right. to pay for it. So you got a voluntary theory of taxation, so, so to speak, uh, which would guarantee efficiency. And, and in a larger sense, Vixel was finding it necessary to go back and look at the rules for making decisions. So right. he said, you know, you need to drop the majority uh, rule requirement, move right. toward the unanimity, at least toward unanimity. Right. And he also said, and this was a big influence on me, we got us, you, economists have got to quit acting as if they're advising benevolent despots, right. which I've quoted many, many, sure. many, many times. And, and so that's an example of, in my own experience with Vixel is an example of serendipity. That is the right. principle of serendipity. Right. Here I had no intention of, of doing anything with this, pull this little book down from the shelf, and here it was just uh, all there, and it's what I wanted to develop. It was implicit in my thinking, but I, it articulated, it brought it out. I was absolutely determined that then I was going to translate that Vixel book into English. In the Vixelian case, um, unanimity plays this mm -hmm. critical mm -hmm. benchmark role and in the calculus of consent, the same idea mm -hmm. appears, mm -hmm. unanimity, and in general, I guess. Well, the calculus of consent is a, is a Vixelian uh, implication. It's right. the implications of the Vixelian argument, yeah. Right. Yeah. 
But there's an interesting move, isn't there, in the calculus of consent? I mean, you've said that Fixell is in a way a constitutionalist because yeah, yeah. he's interested in alternative right, decision right, rules right, and mechanisms. Right, yeah. But in one way, what Vixell recommends is an institution which will instantiate exchange, which will be mm. itself mm. an instrument mm. for exchange. Mm. Whereas in the calculus of consent, there is the shift of uh, the application of unanimity and the idea of the exchange mm. back to the mm. level of rules, mm. which I suppose you could say loosely is the constitutional mm. Right. element right. in in yeah. the yeah. what people yeah. Yeah. call yeah. Buchanan's yeah. constitutional contractarianism yeah. or yeah. contractarian constitutionalism. Yeah. Um, and I, that move um, to the to the level of rules is uh, something that that is very distinctive mm -hmm. and associated mm -hmm. distinctively mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you might talk a little bit about the influences of that, not only mm -hmm. Vixell mm -hmm. but also Rutledge Vining. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that is the central contribution in my evaluation of the calculus of consent. Sure. Seems to me what we did, as you said, Vixell was arguing that, look, we need to change the rules and the only way we can guarantee efficiency is through a unanimity rule. Right. Everybody r rule that out of court. You can't get unanimity. The right. Historically, the Polish attempt sure. to Librem Vito failed. Sure. And, how could you ever get unanimity because somebody would always hold out and all? So you, it's it's a it's a it's a nonsense, uh, absurd type proposal. Right. Uh, and yet the logic seemed airtight. So yeah. what do you, what do you do? And Vixell at least it said let's, let's look at the the rules, but he didn't go beyond that, and he uh -huh. stayed with the sort of as you said a one shot exchange thing. So what we did in the Calx consent was say look. It may well be that to get unanimity on a particular spending project, a particular dimension of pub publicness or politics, is 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 a, is folly to try to think about that. But is it not true that we could move back? We could we could talk about the level at which we choose the rules. Right. Talk about the constitutional level and coming at it from the American context. Uh, constitutions are important. Have been thought to be important. And we were, were thinking in Madisonian type terms, in a way. Um, is it not possible to sort of take that Vixell schemata, apply it to the level of the Constitution, think of a constitutional convention rather than right. a legislature, right. and think of a constitutional convention representing differing interests and coming to agreement on a set of rules? Now, those rules, post constitutional rules, may and may well embody majority rule, certainly sure. non-unanimity rule, so sure. you get things done. But everybody is, in a sense, agreeing to the outcomes or the pattern of outcomes because they have agreed at the level of the Constitution. So you apply the unanimity criterion, the Vixell criterion, applied to the constitutional level. And so that's what the calculus of consent uh, did, I think, right. uh, essentially. Right. And, uh, I mean, did Rutledge Vining well, have, the, vining, the vining point comes in. Um, yeah. the, um, he, he was at the University of Virginia when you went there. Yeah, right, right, right. He had been a long time at the University of Virginia. It turned yeah. out that Vining and I had shared a lot of, of, of common interest in right. the sense that we had both been influenced a great deal by Frank Knight. Uh -huh. And Frank Knight, again, had uh, stressed rules a lot. Right. And Vining himself paid a lot of attention to the impact of rules and, and stressed the point that we don't choose outcomes, we choose rules, and out of which, which generate patterns of outcomes. Right. And so in discussions that we carried on in the Charlottesville period there in, in the late 1950s, early 60s, Vining was very important in the sense that he was, he was reinforcing my right. own proclivity to move in the direction of trying to think about right. uh, rules. And of course, I mean, we shouldn't talk about the Council of Consent without mentioning Gordon yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, and Gordon's contribution. Gordon had spent, Gordon Tullock we're talking about here, yeah. he, he took taken a law degree at the University of Chicago, then he practiced law a bit, and then he went in nine years in the Foreign Service. Ah, oh, right. Uh, yes. Spent some time in the Far East. Right. And then he resigned from the Foreign Service, and he became what he calls the world's only independent scholar for right. a while. Then we 
uh, Warren Nutter and I set up this Thomas Jefferson Center uh, for studies in political economy and social philosophy. We set that up in 1957 in right. Virginia. Right. And the uh, Volcker Fund gave us a five-year grant uh, to uh, bring in distinguished people to come right. as lecturers and also a postdoctoral fellowship. Right, right. And Warren Nutter had known Gordon Tullock as a member of the debate team as undergraduates at oh, Chicago. Chicago right. Shirley Letwin was yes, also on that indeed. team. And uh, so he said, well, maybe Tullock would be interested. He's, he's got this manuscript and he's at Princeton, he's floating around. So we, we gave him the um, first postdoctoral fellowship. He came in the fall of 1958 wow. uh, to Charlottesville. And so he spent that year there, and that's how I got to know Gordon Tullock. And then he went off to the uh, University of South Carolina in the Foreign Affairs Department down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had had enough discussions while he was in Charlottesville that we decided that we were going to start doing some joint work on politics. And he wrote this a paper that was later published in the journal Political Economy called Problems of Majority Voting. Right. Uh, and he and I started working back and forth. And out of that came the calculus of consent. Right. Then he came back to Virginia on the faculty in 1962. While we're talking about the University of Virginia and the people there, I'd like to talk more broadly about that department because it was a wonderful time in the history of the public choice movement and in, in economics generally. I mean, it was an extremely strong and exciting department and for about 10, 12 years there, it uh, was producing the, many of the best graduate mm. students in the country mm. and, uh, and really a very exciting intellectual place. And apart from yourself and Rutledge Vining and Gordon, who we've mentioned, um, there were a number of others, and I wondered about whether you'd like to say something about uh, uh, Warren Nutter, for example, who was the co-director of the of the Thomas Jefferson Center. There was Warren Nutter, and then of course we brought in Ronald Coles. Right. Uh, yeah, I would like to say something about Warren Nutter because Warren, I, I, I share uh, with him the sort of entrepreneurial. Uh, plaudits, I guess, for right. setting up the operation. He and I had been graduate students together at the University of Chicago. We were right. both um, we were both members of this group who were socialists and got converted to right. the market, uh, having uh, spent time in the military before that. And actually, while we were still graduate students, we had said that we needed a place where there would be a center that would sort of try to shift economics back toward its classical foundation. Then 10 years later, we found ourselves pointed to the faculty of the University of Virginia at the same time, more or less. And so we said, let's, let's set something up like this. And we went and we found out that it was very simple. They said, sure, go ahead. Anything right. you want to do, go ahead. So we set up the Thomas Jefferson Center for Studies in uh, Political Economy and Social Philosophy. And Warren Nutter and I shared, as I say, the entrepreneurial part. I mean, I claim no prime credit, nor he, nor would he. We were right. a genuine joint enterprise. Right. And um, we got some funds, as I said, from the Volcker Foundation and, and other, Earhart Foundation and others, to set up this program. We brought in some top visiting uh, lecturers. We brought in uh, Frank Knight and Hayek and Bertie Loline from Sweden, Maurice Allais from France, uh, Bruno Leone from Italy. Uh, Michael Pagliani, we right. brought in a, a whole stream yeah. of distinguished people uh, to give these lectures. And we had these postdoctorals, of which Gordon Tullock was the first. And we began to get very, very good graduate students. We right. also had some good graduate fellowships to offer. And right. so we got extremely good uh, uh, graduate students. Externally, by all odds, we were quite successful. But internally, we were not very successful because mm -hmm. we were hated with a passion uh, by the other faculties of mm -hmm. the university. And as I said earlier, I don't think uh, modern scholars, um, modern academics can possibly appreciate uh, what went on in those days. And the ideological ferment uh, ideological intensity uh, was 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 uh, was tremendous in right. the 1950s and 1960s, and um, uh, we were 
as a department very successful, but on the other hand, we were interpreted by the other Virginia faculty uh, as being um, right-wing fascist. Wow. We were not uh, deserving of appointment at the University of Virginia. So they were determined to get rid of us, determined to wipe us out, and they finally succeeded. Yeah. Um, so they, we began to have difficulties, and they set up special committees to investigate us and uh, so forth and so on. And um, then they made no effort whatsoever to keep Ronald Coase on the faculty. He wanted to stay, he didn't want to go to Chicago, made no effort to keep Andrew Winston on the faculty, would not promote Gordon Tullock. Wow. Um, and finally, we just got fed up and Coase left, Winston left, um, I left, Tullock left, and I left. And finally, this whole thing broke, broke apart. Can I take you back to constitutions and mm -hmm. rules and so on to ask you a question about constitutions with a capital C and constitutions with a small c, that is, the written documents on the one hand versus the practices and rules of the game more generally um, on the other. Well, uh, uh, let me stay with the small c constitution for a bit here. It, it, you see, I, I define the constitution inclusively, small c, as being the, the set of rules, conventions, um, traditions, uh, with, within which a society more or less operates, in which people empirically sort of uh, accept as um, guidelines or, or framework within which they carry on their ordinary activities, both private and public. Uh, now, in that sense, defined that way, a constitution will always exist. Sure, um, exactly. There are always such traditions. And that's where I bring in this relatively absolute, absolute thing again. Uh -huh. That is to say, people treat those as relatively absolute absolutes by comparison with, say, ordinary policy making sure. within, within those constitutions. Now, uh, again, to go back to what I said about alternative uh, models explaining elements uh -huh. of, of this, some of that small c constitution no doubt evolves um, traditions have come up, nobody chose them, they just right. sort of started being there. I think the Hayek problem that he spent, uh, emphasized too much, the evolutionary aspect right. of some of this, and neglected the laid on or explicitly constructed designed sure. aspects. Some parts of the constitutions that we live with, small c, are explicitly designed, laid on, constructed, agreed to, which is more or less the contractarian logic. Others may be originate in coercion. Somebody may have imposed them on right. us, uh, like the Japanese constitution that MacArthur imposed on Japan, much sure. of which still exists. Sure. Uh, so all of these can explain why they're there, but they're there in every, in every country, this, uh, this set of right. uh, traditions, rules. But I think, it is, um, I think it is very, very bad uh, or misleading or has misleading, has unfortunate implications, I guess I should say, if you concentrate too much on the fact that these rules and traditions simply evolve. I think right. that takes attention away from the fact that you can also change them. You yep. can change the rules. And after all, if we're interested in, in reform, we have to think we can change them. Yep. Now, it may be difficult to change sometimes, right. but we don't want to give up in advance, so, right. so to speak. What kinds of provisions would you, uh, would you think ought to be up for debate? Well, I've been on board for a long time in favor of a balanced budget amendment. Right. Uh, now, that doesn't seem so urgent right now since we have surpluses, but sure. I think that's only a temporary thing. And I would like to see a, a, a requirement that the government keep its budget in balance. Right. I would also like to see, and perhaps this is more important really, I'd like to see us constitutionalize the monetary uh, structure right. one way or another. Right. I, I think leaving things up open to the discretion of a central bank is very, very dangerous. Right. Um, and I, I think that's something that we're 
making mistakes all over the world in, right. in terms of uh, independence is not what we want, uh, right. but we want it to, to, to constitutionalize this. Right. Um, there are other ambiguities that probably need to be clarified uh, in, in, a, in a constitutional structure. Um, in, in one sense, in one sense, um, and this gets you very far afield in a way, um, it would have been nice had Madison uh, recognized that you need to keep external markets open as well as internal markets. <laughs> I mean, you see, he, his constitution sort of guaranteed that America was going to be a huge open market internally. Sure. But uh, he left open the fact that we could squeeze off uh, foreign markets by tariffs and uh, I'd like to see the economic constitution mended to. to I think there are many Australians who would that. endorse yes, that. Right, right, <laughs> right. Let's move on to um, uh, an issue which is of concern to me in the whole constitutional exercise—a kind of tension, as I see it, between um, agreement at the constitutional level mm -hmm. and institutional arrangements that themselves have maximum mm -hmm. agreement. And let me take a, an example and, mm -hmm. and see what you think of this. Just take uh, an issue like the sale of mm -hmm. organs, mm -hmm. like live kidneys, mm -hmm. just to, to make it sort mm -hmm. of really uh, salient. Um, on the face of it, you would think that um, a market for kidneys is an instantiation of exchange. Mm. There are mm. people who want mm. kidneys, there's mm. an undersupply mm. of kidneys, mm. there are people who are prepared to give mm. kidneys up mm. for a price. Mm. And if the price is set at zero mm. and it depends on mm. people's goodwill or mm. cadaverous mm. kidneys only, then we won't have enough kidneys mm. uh, to meet the demand. So uh, a proposal comes forward that we should allow the sale of, mm. of, of bodily organs. Now, as I understand your position, it is that ultimately the question of whether that involves uh, maximal exchange or not is not the issue. Mm -hmm. The issue is rather whether we can get consensus on that particular proposal at yeah. a constitutional, yeah. appropriately yeah. constitutional yeah. level. That's right. Is that right? That's right. There may be exchanges that we simply do not uh, uh, approve of, and we want to, and there are obviously the exchanges that, that simply uh, um, are, are ruled out. Right. That, that we just don't, right. don't want to allow them to happen. We right. don't want people to behave that way. Right. And so, right. Uh, the question is, uh, the question is, can we agree to more or less agree, reach a, a substantial consensus on what that list is? Right. Now, we don't want uh, some people going around saying, well, people shouldn't trade in this and that right. uh, um, just because they happen to not Think like so. it or right. they happen to get in charge. But on the other hand, we, we certainly want, if there's a consensus in favor uh, of, of, um, of preventing these types of exchanges going forward, and organs may be something like that in many cases, but we just don't want it to happen. Now, I want to go from there to the issue of liberty itself. Because one might say um, that the failure to allow trades uh, in bodily organs or, or uh, on other margins is an infringement of various mm -hmm. persons' liberty. Mm -hmm. And uh, your interpretation of li liberty and how liberty is to be uh, structured seems to depend on getting constitutional consensus yeah. around it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, how how does your libertarianism, which is mm -hmm. uh, undoubted, mm -hmm. um, sort of sit with uh, with the logic of of contractarianism? No, I I, I acknowledge that there's a tension there uh, right. and a possible contradiction there. I. I could respond in part by saying it's the constitutionalist that is primary and the libertarianism is secondary, but that's not necessarily the case. Right. I, 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 uh, uh, 
in many cases, I, you know, I, libertarianism might trump the constitutionalism in some cases. Right. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't deny that there is that contradiction here. Right. Uh, if you could observe a, um, a constitutional uh, consensus developing on uh, some restrictions on individual liberty that um, um, that I might, for example, just be very strongly opposed to. I, they would, I wouldn't be in the consensus, but you right. might have an overwhelming uh, view of, of, of things, yeah. a body of opinion, and yes. I, that I would. So I don't, I don't deny the contradiction or tension or whatever. It's more right. of a tension, I think. Right. Than anything else. Yeah. Right. Well, Rawls, who we haven't mentioned yeah, yet in yeah, connection yeah, with yeah, yeah, constitutionalism, yeah. but uh, we'll come back to him yeah. for a minute. But he has a nice, I think, way of talking about this in terms of the reflective equilibrium mm. kind mm -hmm. of notion. Mm -hmm. That is that constitutional, mm -hmm. contractarian mm -hmm. kind of thinking mm -hmm. uh, has to be balanced with uh, thinking about the outcomes that it produces and that both... Mm -hmm. are, are relevant for, mm -hmm. for the assessment of, of, of uh, ideas and one wants to bring those intuitions at the two different levels together in some ways so that each disciplines the other. That seems to me to be, you know, I mean it mightn't be totally satisfactory but it does suggest the kind of tatement between one's substantive intuitions and the discipline of, of, as it were, the constitutional contract. Well, but I think there's thinking. a difference here. I think there is right. a difference between the Rawls position, say, and mine on this. On right. This, in the sense that, whereas I can sense that the, the, the tension between the constitutionalist, which is a kind of a logical, structural position, and right. my own sense of a libertarian right. position, I would never claim that that is other than my own. Right. Whereas Rawls is enough of a Kantian to somehow think that there are these sort of ideal uh, uh, precepts out there that he is searching toward. He's right. trying to ground that right. in more than his own personal, ultimate personal values. Right. Whereas I would never go beyond that point, I think. Right. Yeah. Right. I think that is a difference. Right. Yeah. Within the libertarian tradition, there are two kinds of arguments that are often in play. One is the consequentialist defence of free markets, the idea that free markets generate wealth uh, and you've said that that's not really the centrepiece of your own defence of, of market order. And there is another tradition, isn't there, the rights tradition associated with the work of Bob Nozick, I suppose most conspicuously in re recent times, but generally with a, with a libertarian rights position. And generally, you've been inclined to distance yourself from that as well. Do you want to say something about that tradition? Well, I, I think uh, I'm getting into deep water here in the sense that I'm, I, I haven't thought as much about some of these issues as I would somehow like to think about them. I haven't articulated them well in my own mind. Uh, on the other hand, I, I, did, I think that I am, in one sense, closer to the... Um, the rights tradition than I am to the consequentialist position, mm -hmm. or, or I might put it, rather than put it in terms of rights, let's put it in terms of philosophical terms, deontological position, that right. is, uh, not a particularized end, not teleological, right. which is the sort of consequentialist view. Sure. Uh, on the other hand, I think that where I differ with, with Nozick and some of the others is that I don't think there is any clearly defined set of rights that you can delineate independently of, of maybe uh, uh, agreement or contract or constitutionalism. It goes back to that. I mean, there's one notable distinction between yeah. you and Nozick. I mean, yeah. Nozick believe, seems to believe in a minimal state. Yeah. You believe in a productive state, at least the scope for a productive yeah. state. Yeah. I mean, that's more in the Vixellian tradition, I guess, yeah. where yeah. the capacity of governments to provide public goods... Uh, is, yeah. is uh, certainly acknowledged. Um, and you, as I recall, you also say in the, uh, in the review piece that you wrote on Nozick that uh, you thought a very important distinction ought to be drawn between um, 
coercion uh, of a uh, uh, rights-reducing kind uh, and redistribution, say, mm -hmm. through, through the state? Well, for, I think, first of all, I, uh, you're right in a sense of saying that Nozick is for the, is the minimal state, and my position can be interpreted being allowing for a productive state. Uh, I, I would do that, but I perhaps have changed over time. I think it's less likely that the state as it operates will, in fact, generate public goods. I think mm -hmm. it's more likely to generate public bads. Right. So I've moved uh, more toward a minimal or protective state position than I was perhaps 25 years ago or whenever. Right. Right. Uh, and uh, so maybe I'm much more skeptical about the ability of, of politics and the state to, uh, to do that. I, I think, again, to go back to what I said before, I think I differ with Nozick in the sense that he sort of thinks that there are kind of natural boundaries, yes. a kind of a Lockean position, right. which I'm much more Hobbesian than, than he is in that, in that respect.